alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter by chapter, verse by verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour, the book of Ezra. Ezra in the Hebrew tongue meaning help. And you can receive a lot of help from this book in as much as it is a schoolmaster and ultimately will even give us uh, concerning rebuilding the temple, the final temple, which Christ said, uh, destroy it and I'll rebuild it in three days, which means the many-membered body or the real temple, tabernacle, which is to say Christ himself. So looking forward to the Messiah. There is a great deal of knowledge and information in this book that one must uh, learn. It will be written in Aramaic, uh, beginning somewhere in chapter 4. I will call it to your attention, part of it written in that language, most of it written in the Hebrew tongue. And uh, the reason thereof we will discuss when we arrive there. It's important that you be a little familiar with languages to know that when we were giving those that return to build the temple, that um, out of the group, we found that there were many nethanims. And I showed you the Hebrew word nethanim, which means given to service. That is to say, people that were not even Israelites chosen to do liturgical duty until they finally basically began to take over the work of the priest, the Levitical priest, which is bad business. You can remember in Matthew chapter 23, when Christ would arrive about 490 years after this writing, uh, give or take uh, 30 years, then, um, and that, I'm just saying that off the top of my head, it can be figured exact, but uh, the in Matthew 23, Christ would say, the Pharisees and scribes sit in the seat of Moses. What was Moses? The lawgiver. Oh, this, this is something you have to be very careful of. Example, many times your pastor, many of them receive their sermons pre-written, that is to say, outline the subject. Who did the translating? Who did the... Uh, the footwork or legwork to get it together, or your quarterlies. You want to be very careful who your scribes are. That's why I highly recommend sticking with the Word of God and training yourself to be able to recognize instantly, knowing even and having the ability to translate nethanims back to the original language to know who we're talking about here because it becomes very, very important because you can be misled if you don't know who you're studying under. Well, I trust Reverend so Well, that's fine, but who did he study under? Does he take you chapter by chapter and verse by verse and teach you how to study the Word? I hope so. There's a lot of good pastors in this world, and I, I trust that you have one. But always double check. Check this man or any other man out in where? The Word of God. So uh, let's pick it up, if we may, in chapter 2, the verse 58. We'll reread again. Concerning all the way from verses 43 through 58 in this chronological, this chronology of people, they're not, they're not priests. They're not even of the tribe of Judah, nor are they of the tribe of Benjamin. But they got their names in the book, didn't they? That's pretty important. I, that should cause one to be a little concerned, should it not? Well, so, so be it. Chapter 2, verse 58, a word of wisdom from our Father. Let's watch it real closely here. All the Nethinims and the children of Solomon's servants were 390 and 2. You know, it is an amazing thing. You're not going to have it, but I'm going to turn back to 1 Kings chapter 9. I'm going to... Uh, Solomon was a, he, he would be a little lax. Well, I mean, with as many women as he had married, why not? You know, I guess a lot of people might say. But um, 
uh, verse 20 of chapter 9, 1 Kings. What was in this group of servants? I want you, that's what I want you to know. What, what do those names consist of? Verse 20, chapter 9, 1 Kings, and it reads, And all the people that were left of the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, do you realize those are offspring of the fallen angels, the Perizzites? Hivites and Jebusites. Those were the, this is why God himself in Ezekiel 16 would say that Jerusalem had a filthy birth or an unclean birth because the Jebusites built Jebus, which was the original Jerusalem. Okay, here they are, okay, which were not of the children of Israel, definitely were not. Verse 21, their children that were left after them in the land whom the children of Israel also were not able utterly to destroy, God said to do it, upon those did Solomon levy a tribute of bond service unto this day, and I say unto this day liturgical duty performed by people that, uh, and I'll tell you what, between 1 Kings, go back to 1 Chronicles. Uh, next up after the books of Kings, let's read somebody else that was floating along with this group. We're going to go to chap 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55. Listen carefully. These are the scribes for Judah. Do you know what a scribe is? A scribe is one that keeps record. Our people have never liked to do books. Keep very, they just are not record keepers. So here we go. Verse uh, Judah has just been listed, a chronology of the family. And watch this, verse 55. And the families of the scribes, not of Judah, but of the scribes which dwelt at Jabez, the Tyrathites, Shimeathites, the Shushathites, these are the Kenites. That means the sons of Cain, K-E-N-I-T-E-S, meaning the offspring of Cain, that came of Hemoth, the father of the house of Rechab, meaning the Kenites worked right, doing the book work, doing the writing. Who, who, does, who does your uh, uh, legwork for you in your deeper studies of God's Word? Do you do it yourself, or do you trust someone? Well, the Bible says we should trust. No, it says to have faith in God, and this is His Word. He has all sorts of clues for a wise person to know. You better keep your eyes open. You better keep your mind open, or you can be deceived. So here we go. We got all these people that are going back to build a temple. God having surnamed or named beforehand Cyrus, uh, another person that was, was not of Adam or Israelite, I should say. And um, uh, they're going back to build the temple of God. Verse 59 in chapter 2, let's go with it as we return there. And these were they which went up from Telmala, uh, Tel Harsha, Cherub, Adan, and Immer, but they could not show their father's house and their seed whether they were of Israel. They couldn't prove it. Why? They weren't. Verse 60. The children of Deliah, the children of Tobiah, the children of Nicoda, 652, verse 61. And the children of the priest, you understand, these were priests now. The children of Habiah, the children of Kaz, the children of Barzillia, which took a wife of the daughters of Barzillia, the Gedalite, and was called after their name. Do you, do you know what? I mean, married a wife of the children of Barzilla, and rather than keep their own name, they changed to his name. Now, so who, where was their, where was their um, uh, respecter of lineage? It certainly wasn't the house of Judah, verse 62. 
these sought their register among those that were reckoned by genealogy, but they were not found. Therefore were they as polluted put from the priesthood. They could no longer be priests again. Hey, well, that, it doesn't matter. Stick around a year or two. They'll forget, and they'll be back priests again. And who will ask questions? You see, if they have already entered in in all the liturgical duties and become the so-called teachers, who's to teach truth, and how are, you, how are the unlearned ever going to learn if the elders allow such stuff as this in. Now that's what this is about, is a little bit of house cleansing here in the house of God. And some I can hear already. Well, you're not supposed to, you're, it's not politically correct to show a difference. Oh, well, tell that to Almighty God. It makes a difference to him. Verse 63. And the Tershatha said unto them. Now this Tershatha is a Persian word, and it's probably best translated into English as governor. Both Nehemiah, the book that follows Ezra, the, the, the person that my book is named after, and Zerubbabel are referred to as Tershatha. Uh, Nehemiah three times is called the Tershatha in the book of Nehemiah, so there's a little bit of debate among scholars, uh, students, as far as whether this is talking about Zerubbabel or Nehemiah. But whoever the governor was the governor at the time uh, said unto them that they should not eat of the most holy things till there stood up a priest with Urim and Thummim. Uh, a couple things on this. Not only were they not to eat of the most holy things, which uh, there were seven things that were considered to be holy, four were considered most holy. Uh, the incense offering, which obviously they would not have eaten of that to begin with. The showbread, uh, the sin and trespass offerings, which were lumped together. And then the meal offering, minka, in the Hebrew language. What this verse is saying, the, the governor of Jerusalem said, since you cannot prove your genealogy, you're not to approach the altar of burnt offering. You're not to enter the holy, in the holy place, which is the area where you would find uh, the uh, uh, showbread, in the, not the holy of holies, as some of you may be thinking, where the ark was located, and of course, they don't have an ark at this time, which brings me to my next point. We're talking here that, that and some say, well, what was wrong with Yeshua, the high priest, that he couldn't consult of the Lord with the Urim and Thummim? There must, there must have been something wrong with his character, or maybe he wasn't the oldest son and therefore not entitled to be the high priest. Well, that's not the case at all. Consider these people are coming back after 70 years in captivity. There is nothing to speak of left of the temple of Solomon, Solomon's temple, the house of God, which was a magnificent structure. And what, where was the priest to do with the Urim and Thummim? Well, he had a little pocket in his breastplate that held the Urim and Thummim. And he was to go into the presence of the Lord. And God himself said, I will appear unto you above the mercy seat. And the mercy seat being the Ark of the Covenant. And they don't have an ark. They don't have a temple. They don't have a mercy seat. So I think what the governor, Tershatha, whether that be Zerubbabel or Nehemiah, is saying here is, Hopefully, as things get going here and we have a temple, perhaps God will manifest himself again in the cloud above the mercy seat as he did in both the Mosaic uh, temple or tabernacle, the tent of Moses, in other words, or the house of the Lord that Solomon built. Uh, the Urim and Thummim, by the way, are never mentioned again as being used to consult of the Lord subsequent to the return of the captivity. 
uh, and neither did the Lord uh, manifest himself in the cloud in the temple that Zerubbabel and the others would build, um, just would not do it. Um, remember, though, uh, he said, I'm going to cleanse this house one more time, and next time it needs to be cleansed, you cleanse it yourself. And there is a time coming when he will cleanse that area once again, and that is after Antichrist to set up his shop in Jerusalem. And uh, I look forward to that day, as I know many of you do. Verse 64. The whole congregation together was 40 and 2,303 score, 42,360, many of them Nethanim and many of them Solomon's servants in this numbering, many who couldn't prove their bloodline was of Judah, Benjamin, or Levi. Beside their servants and their maids, of whom there were 7,330 and seven. Now, what's this? 7,337 servants and maids? And these people were in captivity? Well, as the Lord promised, many of them did very well in the captivity, obviously, to have maids and servants. And there were among them 200 singing men and singing women. Uh, a lot of people don't, they wrestle with this last phrase, uh, are we talking about Levitical singers? No, we're not, because the Levitical singers are mentioned in verse 41 of this same chapter. Uh, some people say that the words in the Hebrew language, singing men and singing women, is very close to cattle and oxen. And the tired eyes of a scribe made the error of translating this uh, singing men and singing women. I don't think so, and I think that's an excuse by some to try and say that the Word of God uh, has some bad errors in it. That's not the case. It was singing men and singing women from the get-go. The, the Hebrew people hired people to sing, whether it be uh, songs of jubilation to, to cheer people up, or whether it was songs of lamentation, sad songs. Uh, oftentimes the, at funerals, the, the people, the family of the deceased would hire people to sing lamentations, and that was common. Verse 66, their horses were 730 and 6, and their mules 240 and 5. Now, uh, what we're going to be talking about are animals that could be ridden or could be to carry burdens. I would think as many people as we have going, 42,360 uh, plus the 7,000 uh, 337 maids and servants plus the singers, we're talking about a lot of people and we're not having a lot of animals here, 730 and six horses. And remember, these people are picking up and moving lock, stock, and barrel. They're carrying everything they own back to Judah and Jerusalem with them. So many of these animals, I'm sure, were utilized to carry burdens rather than to carry riders. Perhaps uh, the eldest of the people, which we are going to see there were some people that were pretty old, and for indeed they had seen the original uh, Temple of Solomon. We'll see that when we get to chapter 3. And when they came back to Jerusalem, the place where it was, uh, and the, the first uh, foundation stone was laid, they wept. So we've got some people that are in their 80s, maybe 90s, uh, on up from that. So possibly the eldest and the sickliest uh, were allowed to ride animals, but for the most part, I think the people walked. And it was a long, hard journey uh, that took approximately four months, 67. Their camels, 430 and 5, their asses, 6,720. And most of these either owned by the people, or you might recall in chapter 1, Cyrus asked that the neighbors of the Hebrews, the neighbors of the Judeans and the people of Benjamin and the Levites give gifts, you know, movable goods, livestock, gold, silver, give it to them and help them as they prepare to go back. Because again, they're starting from scratch. 
And evidently those peoples, those neighbors were very generous. Verse 68. And some of the chief of the fathers, these being the heads of the fathers' houses, these are Israelites, people of Judah and Benjamin for the most part, Levi that we're talking about, when they came to the house of the Lord, which is at Jerusalem, offered freely for the house of God to set it up in his place. In other words, offerings so that the temple uh, could be rebuilt. There was not much left after the third siege on Jerusalem uh, by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon's armies. Verse 69. They gave after their ability unto the treasure of the work three score and one thousand drams of gold and five thousand pound of silver and one hundred priest garments. Very generous of the heads of the fathers after having been in captivity for seventy years. Again, I think indication that life really wasn't all that tough uh, under the Babylonian captivity as God promised them that it would be. I can see them delivering these 100 priest garments, the Nethanims, uh, those that are, uh, and also those claiming to be of the priesthood probably said, oh, send, send a dozen of those over to our tent. We can use those. Verse 70. So the priests and the Levites and some of the people and the singers, now we are talking about the Levitical singers here, and the porters, the porters and the singers both being divisions of the Levites. Now the porters, what their job in the temple was the uh, uh, guarding of the doors or the gates, if you will. And the Nethanims dwelt in their cities and all Israel in their cities. In other words, we're not talking about just the repopulation of Jerusalem here. and We're talking about the smaller towns around Judah or around Jerusalem making up Judea and also the cities of Benjamin being repopulated. But they're all going and, you know, building probably their own houses first. If, if there was nothing left of their inheritance, their property, if you will, that was given to them by the Lord. And, you know, I can see nothing wrong. You know, you've got to have a little bit of shelter over your head or though you're subject to the elements and attack and everything else. Uh, these lands around here, as we'll see in chapter 3 and 4, were pop populated by the Samaritans, those peoples that the uh, Nebuchadnezzar and his descendants shipped in to take the place of the, or I should say the Assyrian, not Nebuchadnezzar, the Assyrian, uh, Sennacherib, Sennian people to populate the area of Israel, which for the most part would be to the north of Jerusalem, uh, Judah, and Benjamin. But as I started to say, I can, I can understand having to have a little bit of cover over your house, but what we're going to find out, and, and it's written in Haggai chapter 1, verse 9, the prophecy of the Lord through Haggai, the Lord says, you know, uh, my house lies waste and every man runs to his own house. And they're making them nice, putting uh, cedar lining in them and everything else while the house of the Lord uh, lies in waste. Chapter 3, we come to the altar of burnt offering is going to be built, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles celebrated, and also the foundation of the house of God laid. Uh, it didn't take them long to get around to lying the foundation of the house of the Lord. Uh, the completion of it, that's a completely different story, as we'll see. Chapter 3, verse 1. And when the seventh month was come, and we'll see from verse 6, it wasn't the seventh month yet when the events in the next verses occurred, but the seventh month approached. And the children of Israel were in the cities. The people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Now, it doesn't say what year this is, but I believe, as most scholars do, that uh, this would have been in the first year that they arrived in Jerusalem out of Babylon. The seventh month when the Hebrew calendar known as Tishri, uh, a very sacred month that, uh, as prescribed by law, God's law, 
the first day of this month would be the Feast of Trumps, and so-called because the priest would blow the trumpets, the silver trumpets, ringing in this very festal month, a very uh, religious month, if you will. The tenth day of Tishri was uh, the, prescribed the Day of Atonement, and this was the day that the high priest and the high priest alone went into the Holy of Holies, and, uh, on, and the purpose of that to atone for the sins of himself and all of Israel, the sins of the previous year that had not been atoned for. And, of course, that's where we had the scapegoat, uh, one goat uh, representing Satan and then one goat representing God. The one representing God would be offered as a sin offering. Uh, the one representing Satan called Azazel in the Hebrew language uh, was the sins of the people were placed upon that goat. And then finally in Tishri, the seventh month, you had the seven-day uh, Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkoth in the Hebrew language, and that then followed by one day on the eighth day it was not part of the Feast of Tabernacles, but there was then a Sabbath uh, to end the cycle of feasts throughout the year on the Hebrew calendar. Verse 2, Then stood up Yeshua, the son of Josedach. Yeshua also can be translated Joshua, transliterated Joshua. The name Jeshua, uh, if you don't pronounce the J, because there are no J's in the Hebrew language, is the name of Jesus that you often hear us use here at the chapel, which means Yahweh's Savior. Now, Jeshua was indeed... Ezra's nephew, because it says here that Jeshua uh, was the son of Josedach, Josedach being the brother of Ezra, which can be proven from First Chronicles chapter 6, uh, th that, that Josedach was the son of Sariah, the priest, and then we'll see in chapter uh, 7, verse 1, that Ezra is also the son of of Sariah, Sariah being the high priest who was killed at Riblah by Nebuchadnezzar. The son of Josedach and his brethren, the priest, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, the people of Judah, in other words, and builded the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And this of God here is with the article. You've got a note in your companion Bible which indicates the true God. Remember, remember the names. Remember the names that, uh, that uh, were spoken there concerning Joshua's, uh, the son of Zadok and Zerubbabel, okay? This is still carrying through in the seventh month, all right? Chapter 2 of Haggai, verse 2. Follow with me. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, this is what you say to them, who is left among you that saw this house in, in her first glory, and how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? And, and I, it wasn't, you know, compared to Solomon's temple, man, I mean, it was fancy. And when they finally get it built, well, um, in, in the eyes of the ones that lived were old enough to know, it didn't look like much. Verse 4, Yet now be strong, five, according to the word that I coveted, I contracted with you when you came out of Egypt. So my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. And back to Exodus um, 29, 45, I think, uh, 6, verse 6. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little thing while, and I will uh, shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. Now, those of you that just finished studying Hebrews, you know what this means. There's only one time he's going to shake both the heaven and the earth. That's looking to the end of this earth age, a dispensation of time, I should say. It's coming down to the day before the millennium. 
and naturally then you know as a student of God's word he's referring to the final temple verse uh, 7 and I will shake all nations and the desire of all nations shall come this means um, this means the desire of all nations is what Messiah the Messiah will come the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. How will it be filled with glory? Because Christ would be there. Now, ultimately, why did I do this? To weave together for you the fact that God gives many lessons concerning the building of his house, whereby you can see and understand. Yet he never deviates from his plan, and people must be taught. Here, the city, because of the misbehavior of, of uh, the ten tribes as well as these two tribes, he, he just had to get rid of them for a while, for a while. And now, in bringing them back, it's starting from scratch. So here they stand. Thank God they did build an, al build an altar. And again, I hope they were wise enough, they were careful who built it. So let's return to chapter 3 of the great book of Ezra, verse 3. three. And they set the altar upon his bases. Now this should be uh, translated, they set it in its former place, meaning exactly where the altar of burnt offering was in Solomon's temple. For fear was upon them because of the people of those countries. And they offered burnt offerings thereon, unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening. In other words, the daily sacrifices reinstituted again to be uh, offered every morning and every evening. Now, the people of these countries, I think, are the Samaritans that the Assyrians shipped in. These people were from all over the world and had a mixed bag of religion. They had a mixed bag of politics. They were just a mixed group of people. But when they come to find out that these people were in the land and around Jerusalem, in other words, and watching them, uh, they became fearful of them. Bear in mind, they don't have the walls of the temple up, much less the walls of the city to protect themselves. To the Lord, I think they're asking him uh, to be their wall of protection until the walls of the city can be rebuilt. I hope you know that the Lord is your wall of protection. There is no better protection. Verse 4. They kept also the Feast of Tabernacles as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the custom as the duty of every day required. These were written of in the law of Leviticus chapter 23, uh, verses 34 and the following verses. And there were a different number of sacrifices prescribed for each day of the seven-day feast. On the first day, they were to offer 13 bullocks, two rams, and 14 lambs. The second day, they were to offer 12 bullocks, two rams, and 14 lambs. Each day, uh, the number of bullocks offered reduced by one. Verse 5. And afterward, offered the continual burnt offering, both of the new moons and of all the set feasts of the Lord that were consecrated, and of every one that willingly offered a free will offering unto the will Lord. Will offering unto the Lord. Uh, now, I might should add, you would find in Zechariah that they man kind of made some feast days of his uh, fa fasting and holidays of his own, special days, feast of the this month, that month, and so forth. God didn't order those. We'll perhaps talk about them before we finish the book. Verse 6. From the first day of the seventh month began they to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord. But the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. I mean, they were sent there for a reason. Their work detail is not being established. We've got months going by here. Now, it's true that in this country it would take a little while to get stuff together. But um, 
uh, it's a little bit sad. That's what the whole book of Haggai is about, is dressing down the people. Verse 7, they gave money also unto the masons and to the carpenters and meat and drink and oil unto them of Zidon and to them of Tyre to bring cedar trees from Lebanon. The Tyre, oh, they were money changers. They always had uh, big ships of Tarshish that could haul uh, cedar from Lebanon to the Sea of Joppa according to the grant that they had of Cyrus, king of Persia. And uh, he set it all up for them. He's still, he's doing his part, Cyrus says. He knows better than to disobey God because God has given him his every wish. Verse 8. Now in the second year of their coming unto the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month begins Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josedach, and the remnant of their brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all they that were come out of the captivity unto Jerusalem, and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to set forward the work of the house of the Lord. I mean, this is two years and months later after they got there. What have they been doing? Um, you know, you know and I know God hates lazy people. God, maybe I rephrase that to say God just doesn't bless and doesn't like lazy people. In the book of Proverbs, he likens them to as the hinges are to a door, so are they hinged to a mattress. They just flop from one side to the other. I mean, I mean, they haven't been on the ball. That's obvious, okay? And um, God hasn't complained all that much yet. Verse 9, Then stood Jeshua with his sons and his brethren, uh, Cadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah, together to set forward the workmen in the house of God about time, the sons of Hinnadad, and um, uh, Hinnadad means the grace of Hadad, mighty, okay, with their sons and their brethren, the Levites. I mean, it took a little while to make muster, did it not? Two years and a couple of months? Ten. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priest in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, Asaph is a collector of the people, they better be collecting some people here, with symbols to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. So um, uh, here um, we have the proper background for the foundation, asking the blessings, no doubt. I still say about time, verse 11, and they sang together by course and praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because he is good for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel and all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Two years and months and finally, they get the foundation laid. Now, that's, uh, that's slow contracting under anybody's rules. And, and I'm, uh, well, what are you complaining about it? To be patient. Well, God's not, God is patient and long-suffering. But you see, waste of fulfilling God's word does not make our Father a happy person. All right? He's not going to bless as he could bless. The you earn by work his blessings. That work in whatever way that God has gifted you that you should work, whether it's professional uh, or in your own business, whatever the case. But in moving ahead and telling God you love him. But, I mean, here we got... All this time went by, but they're, they're now, they're on a roll, verse 12. But many of the priests and Levites and the chief of the fathers who were ancient men 
that had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes wept with a loud voice and many shouted aloud for joy. I mean, here they had been without the house of God for a long time, had been in captivity, and now finally they're building this place of worship. Verse 13 to complete the chapter. So that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, uh, and the noise was heard afar off. Um, it did not have the splendid appearance, probably, but it was the house of God, and it was being rebuilt on Mount Zion. And God will accept it, as you would learn in the Minor Prophets. Um, Haggai, you know, I said you, it would do you well to take a home assignment. I'm not going to teach it here, nor will I begin with it tomorrow. But I would highly recommend that you cover the first chapter in the great book of Haggai, which precedes chapter 2 I read from today there. The old man gets on their case. He tells them, he said, hey, why, why do you think your bucket's full of holes? Why do you think God's not blessing you? Because you all have fancy houses. You've managed in two years to build yourself houses, but where's God's house? He, he gets on their case. And it might learn you a lesson that if it ever seems to you like your holes got bucket, uh, your bucket's got holes in it, in other words, that that you think you gain leaks away, which simply is a uh, Hebraism meaning uh, God's not only not going to bless you, he's going to see that a hole swallows up everything you work for and scratch out the miserable way yourself if, if he's not happy with you. You see, they were not doing well in God's eye. But... We're getting the job done. We'll get there. I, I don't want to, I'm not slamming them. But we, I am a teacher, and we are to learn lessons from God's Word as to how to ple be pleasing to God so that you receive God's blessings. All right, bless your hearts. Don't miss the next lecture. Stay tuned uh, and listen just a moment, won't you please?